Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, written by Adrienne Marie Brown. Resilience, How We Recover and Transform, Part 2. Lessons from a Transformative Breakup. How to find new ways to be in each other's lives and not split the communities we love or the movements we support. Try every single thing you can to make it work and articulate the effort you are making to each other. Even things you aren't sure will work. Try everything. This will matter later. Love yourself. Don't let fear make you settle for something you know isn't working. Be honest. The harder things are to say, the more necessary they are to say. Commit to being in each other's lives and doing whatever is needed to ensure that in the long term. This may include being far away from each other, physically and in social media and in all communications, in the short term. Set boundaries around communication and stick to them. This includes how often to communicate, what is it okay to talk about, who it's okay to talk to about the process, and permission to express feelings. You can identify a new boundary as you go along if something hurts or doesn't feel right. Don't tell anyone else until you are ready. Be intentional about who you tell, what you say, and letting people know what is and isn't okay to talk or ask about. Write a letter to your community if need be. That way, your true story trumps gossip and bullshit. Feel your feelings. Feel your feelings. Feel your feelings. Gather trusted support around you and lean on them as much as necessary. Together, tell the story of your relationship to a trusted and neutral friend. What happened? What was great? What did you learn? Be as honest as possible and take the time to tell the whole thing. Don't judge each other's choices, feelings, or processes. You can't actually know what is going on for the other person. Take responsibility for your own feelings and act accordingly. When you feel ready, dream together about the new relationship you want to have with each other. As you come into new post-breakup relationship with each other, watch for your patterns and take it slow. Celebrate your maturity and growth and ability to be present and do this. Invite others to celebrate and applaud the efforts. When you feel ready, enjoy the friendship that you made possible together. Please note, all of this is in the case of a generally awesome, healthy relationship that doesn't quite work, not an abusive one that you may need to actually completely leave quickly. Transformative justice in an abusive dynamic. Quote, like everything in nature, we all have gifts. Sometimes, the gifts don't seem like gifts. The bee that stings, the stinging nettle that irritates your skin. But when we look at our ecosystem in totality, it is clear how each piece is necessary for the whole. It's a reminder to make room for all of us in our fiery, stinging glory. Unquote. Carissa Lewis. Quote, Every living thing has a role in the ecosystem and its own destiny to fulfill. Even things we can't see, don't like, or don't understand. Unquote. Judy Hatcher. When an abusive dynamic builds between lovers, family, partners, or co-workers, it is first and foremost important to understand that it is a dynamic that both and all parties are playing into consciously and unconsciously. This is different from an abusive event, one explosive moment. This is when there is habitual emotional, spiritual, and or physical violence and cruelty. An abusive dynamic is sustained by the two or more people directly involved in it and a bevy of others who ignore, enable, or exacerbate it. When we are children or dependents, we don't usually have full agency to shift or leave an abusive dynamic because our safety and livelihood depend upon our abuser, and many of us figure out other ways of quote-unquote leaving. 
dissociation, appeasing, addiction, etc. When we are adults, we can begin to notice how we are playing into the dynamic to shift. We have agency, even if we feel like we are solely victims. That realization can be liberation itself. Often, the same dynamics echo across different realms of our lives. What we allow in our home and love realm shows up with our friends, or with our families, or with our coworkers, bosses, or partner organizations. It is our pattern, our shape. These patterns are prevalent within our movements, spilling the boundaries of our personal lives and creating toxicity in our organizations and networks. We perpetuate abusive dynamics under the guise of accountability, callouts, even solidarity and love. If you have the ability to see the dynamic, to see yourself in a pattern and walk away before reaching the point of emotional or physical harm, bravo. And if not, hey, most of us don't. We need community to hold us in our dignity and to support transformative justice. Here are a few signs that you may be in an abusive movement, work, family, friendship, or romantic dynamic. You make agreements or set boundaries and they get crossed or broken, and or you can't hold the agreements and boundaries yourself. You can't communicate directly with the person or people about issues or concerns. Culture of gossip usually grows here in the family, office, or group. When you raise the issue that agreements or boundaries are not being held, there is no accountability. The other person or people deny the transgression, say they forgot the agreements, say it is your fault, ridicule you, continue the transgression, and or you can't see your accountability in boundary crossing and or diminish the harm. There is a culture of blaming or dishonesty that breaks down trust over time. You don't feel comfortable processing the issues of the dynamic with friends, co-workers, allies. You feel ashamed or like it will upset the other person or people in the dynamic. Arguments are really confusing and or repetitive. You can't tell what you are arguing about. The arguments have no boundaries or containers. You keep returning to issues you felt were resolved or you keep losing track of your own values and center in the process. You feel dismissed, hidden, or disrespected, and or, like you can't acknowledge reality, be transparent or respectful. You feel like a core part of yourself is compromised or not welcome, and or you want to change a core aspect of another person or group. You feel bullied or bullying, scared or scary, emotionally unsafe. And you feel like something is being taken from you and or that you are taking from the other person. Once you become aware of the dynamic, it is important to take some space to get clear in yourself. So often these dynamics perpetuate because we are scared to be alone, scared to create conflict, scared to take a step back. And then once we do, we get more air, more clarity. If it feels like there is work that can be done for mediation, healing, and transformation, by all means, put time and attention there, but with some humility. The nature of abusive dynamics is that they are foggy and hard to navigate from within. Often, we leap to couples therapy or office mediation while still in the private fog of it all. Get transparent and current with trusted friends or comrades who can offer perspective on the situation. You have the right to tell your story. The silence and shame around these dynamics makes people think they are alone and especially flawed. Not so. Organizations are rife with abusive bosses or collective members. Social justice movements are full of couples in private battles against the oppressive dynamics we face in the world. You are not alone and you do not have to be silent. You do not have the right to traumatize abusive people, to attack them personally or publicly, or to sabotage anyone else's health. The behaviors of abuse are also survival-based. 
learned behaviors rooted in some pain. If you can look through the lens of compassion, you will find hurt and trauma there. If you are the abused party, healing that hurt is not your responsibility, and exacerbating that pain is not your justified right. You do have the right to walk away, to literally and virtually gather yourself up and remove yourself from the dynamic. Take space in order to remember and fortify yourself. You have the right to create boundaries that generate more possibilities for you. Those boundaries may be short-term or permanent. You have the right to ask for support from your friends and community. It really helps to find neutral mediators or mediation teams to support conversations that the abusive dynamics may make difficult. Sometimes, the feeling of things being unresolved will keep pulling you back into the conversation. Mediation can help draw the line. You are not obligated to engage in a process with someone if you do not feel like it, whether you feel unsafe or exhausted or angry. While we are working towards a world where all conflict can be resolved in a transformative way, we aren't there yet, and a lot of messy shit goes down in the name of transformative justice. One thing to really track here, if you are the abuser or in a mutually abusive dynamic and you don't want to participate in a process, this could be you dodging responsibility that, if you did take it on, could transform your life and future relationships. But it's up to you. You have the right to not know the right moves to make. Quote, I remember as a small child seeing the geese flying south. Firefly season. A cicada that lived for a while in the cracks of the cement bricks that made up our porch wall. A flash flood sweeping cars away while we were huddled under an overhang on a picnic. Lightning felling a tree in our backyard. I guess I learned that everything will pass. But also, and equally true, it will all come back again. Unquote. Karen Joy Fowler One of the fastest ways to learn interdependence is to shift how we show up in relationship, primarily to get more honest in our relationships. I'm not saying you especially are a liar. I'm saying we are a culture of liars. We learn to lie, either with overt mistruths or egregious omissions, at a very intimate level. Not to ask for what we need, not to say aloud what we want, not to be honest when things hurt or bother us. Here are some reasons we swallow our truths. Capitalism. We are taught that love is about belonging to one person or community, and we must contort in order to ensure continued belonging. We are taught that our value is in what we can produce and emotions impede production. The oppression of supremacy. We are taught that if we are not white, male, straight, able, wealthy, adult, etc., our truths don't matter. This starts very early. We are taught that our feelings and thoughts as children are unimportant, that we are to, quote, be seen and not heard, unquote. The oppression of false peace. We are taught that our truths are disruptive and that disruption is a negative act. This one is particularly insidious and ties back into capitalism. Only those moving towards profit can and should create disruption. Everyone else should be complacent consumers. For these reasons and others, we stay in the realm of repressed emotions and passive or outright aggression, and we end up in personal and professional relationships that don't serve us. Because we are fractal creatures, these patterns repeat in every part of our lives. To close the gap between what we actually want and need and what we communicate to others, we have to be in the practice of authenticity in relationship, or what I am calling liberated relationship. 
Here are some of the principles in development for liberated relationships. Radical honesty. No omissions, no white lies, no projections. Ask the questions you really want answered. Speak your truth and let the relationship build inside all that reality. Just a note from experience. The small lies can be the hardest to stop telling. No, I don't want to get on the phone right now. Can we just text? I'm busy catching up on my reality TV show. Real cow milk ice cream. Or, I know I said I didn't want to blank, but now I do. However, the more you practice this, the more you will find yourself spending your waking hours in the ways you want to, the ways that honor the miracle of your existence which was not given to you to waste in polite avoidance of hurting people's feelings. You will find that you can be honest and kind. You can be honest and compassionate. Acknowledge the dynamics and then keep growing. Have an understanding on the front end of the race, class, gender, ability, geographic, and other power dynamics that exist between you. And also remember that these are constructs. Be in the complexity of living inside these constructs while evolving beyond them through relationship. Relinquish Frankenstein. You are not creating people to be with or work with some idealized individuals made of perfect parts of personality that you discovered on your life journey. You are meeting individuals with their own full lives behind and ahead of them. Stop trying to make and fix others and instead be curious about what they have made of themselves. Okay, do you want to try liberated relationships? I suggest starting with one and building from there. Pick one person who is in your life right now, someone you want a more authentic relationship with, and tell them exactly that. Ask if you can practice radical honesty together. It is difficult at first, but the results are unparalleled freedom and satisfaction. As you grow this skill, bring it to work, to family, to love. I have found that I now spend immensely less time managing the truth for others and have people around me who want and encourage the real me to show up. In the practices section, check out, quote, co-evolution through friendship and woes, unquote. We are still beginning. I've been thinking a lot about transformative justice lately. In the past few months, I've been to a couple of gatherings I was really excited about and then found myself disappointed, not because drama kicked up, which is inevitable, but because of how we as participants and organizers and people handled those dramas. Simultaneously, I've watched several public takedowns, callouts, and other grievances take place on social and mainstream media. Some of those have been of strangers, but recently I've had the experience of seeing people I know and love targeted and taken down. In most cases, very complex realities get watered down into one flawed aspect of these people's personalities, or one mistake or misunderstanding. A mob mentality takes over then, an evisceration of character that is punitive, traumatizing, and isolating. This has happened with increasing frequency over the past year, such that I'm wondering if those of us with an intention of transforming the world have a common understanding of the kind of justice we want to practice now and in the future. What we do now is find out someone or some group has done or may have done something out of alignment with our values. Some of the transgressions are small, saying something fucked up, being disrespectful in a group process. Some are massive, false identity, sexual assault. We then tear that person or group to shreds in a way that affirms our values. We create memes reducing someone to the laughing stock of the internet that day. We write think pieces on how we are not like that person and obviously wouldn't make the same mistakes they have made. 
We deconstruct them as thinkers, activists, groups, bodies, partners, parents, children, finding all of the contradictions and limitations and shining bright light on them. When we are satisfied that that person or group is destroyed, we move on. Or, sometimes we just move on because the next scandal has arrived, the smell of fresh meat overwhelming our interest in finishing the takedown. I say we and our intentionally here. I'm not above this behavior. I laugh at the memes. I like the apoplectic statuses, the rants with no named target that very clearly critique a specific person. I've been examining this, why I can get caught up in a mob on the internet in a way I rarely do in life. The positive mob mentality I participate in for, say, Beyonce or Bjork feels quite different, though I know there is something in there about belonging. Eh, that's the next book. I have noticed that at the most basic level, I feel better about myself because I'm on the right side of history, or at least, the news cycle. But lately, as the attacks grow faster and more vicious, I wonder, is this what we're here for? To cultivate a fear-based adherence to reductive common values? What can this lead to in an imperfect world full of sloppy, complex humans? Is it possible we will call each other out until there's no one left beside us? I've had tons of conversations with people who, in these moments of public flaying, avoid stepping up on the side of complexity or curiosity because in the back of our minds is the shared unspoken question. When will y'all come for me? I have also had experiences where I absolutely wanted to take somebody down, expose them as a liar, cheater, manipulator, assailant, in each of these situations, time, conversation, and vulnerability have created other possibilities, and I have ended up glad that I didn't go that route, which is generally so short-term in its impact. Sometimes this was because transformation was possible between us. Sometimes this was because the takedown wouldn't have had the impact I wanted. Destroying a person doesn't destroy all the systems that allow harmful people to do harm. These takedowns make it seem as if massive problems are determined at an individual level, as if these individuals set a course as children to become abusers, misogynists, racist liars. How do I hold a systemic analysis and approach when each system I am critical of is peopled in part by the same flawed and complex individuals that I love? This question always leads me to self-reflection. If I can see the ways I am perpetuating systemic oppressions, if I can see where I learned this behavior and how hard it is to unlearn it, I start to have more humility as I see the messiness of the communities I am part of, the world I live in. The places I'm drawn to in movement espouse a desire for transformative justice, justice practices that go all the way to the root of the problem and generate solutions and healing there such that the conditions that create injustice are transformed. A lot of people use these words, and yet, we don't really know how to do it. We call it, quote, unquote, transformative justice when we're throwing knives and insults, exposing each other's worst mistakes, reducing each other to moments of failure. We call it holding each other accountable. I recently reposted these words from Ryan Lee Dahlstrom, speaking about this trend in the queer community. I'm feeling really tired of the call-out culture on social media, especially within queer and trans people of color communities. We need to center and build relationships with one another and not keep tearing one another down publicly while trying to have direct conversations. While there are many places of learning, growth, and contradictory practice within the world we live in, why can't we talk to one another directly and allow room for learning from our mistakes or differences? By making these public attacks on each other, we are engaging in the same disposability politics of capitalism and the prison industrial complex that we purport to be against while feeding into state surveillance tactics that are monitoring how we are tearing each other down. Enough is enough, y'all. We need each other now more than ever.
Yes, Ryan Lee, I too am tired of it, but I see it everywhere I turn. When the response to mistakes, failures, and misunderstandings is emotional, psychological, economic, and physical punishment, we breed a culture of fear, secrecy, and isolation. So I'm wondering, in a real way, how can we pivot toward practicing transformative justice? How do we shift from individual, interpersonal, and interorganizational anger toward viable, generative, sustainable systemic change? In my facilitation and mediation work, I've seen three questions that can help us grow. I offer them here in context with a real longing to hear more responses, to get in deep practice that helps us create conditions conducive to life in our movements and communities. How can we pivot toward practicing transformative justice? How do we shift from individual, interpersonal, and interorganizational anger toward viable, generative, sustainable systemic change? In my facilitation and mediation work, I've seen three questions that can help us grow. I offer them here in context with a real longing to hear more responses, to get in deep practice that helps us create conditions conducive to life in our movements and communities. First, why? Listen with why as a framework. People mess up. We lie, exaggerate, betray, hurt, and abandon each other. When we hear that something bad has happened, it makes sense to feel anger, pain, confusion, and sadness. But to move immediately to punishment means that we stay on the surface of what has happened. To transform the conditions of the quote-unquote wrongdoing, we have to ask ourselves and each other, why? Even and especially when we are scared of the answer. It's easy to decide a person or group is shady, evil, psychopathic. The hard truth hard because there's no quick fix, is that long-term injustice creates most evil behavior. The percentage of psychopaths in the world is just not high enough to justify the ease with which we attempt to label that condition to others. In my mediations, why is often the game-changing, possibility-opening question. That's because the answers rehumanize those we feel are perpetrating against us. Why often leads us to grief, abuse, trauma, often undiagnosed mental illnesses like depression or bipolar disorder, difference, socialization, childhood, scarcity, loneliness. Also, why makes it impossible to ignore that we might be capable of a similar transgression in similar circumstances? We don't want to see that. Demonizing is more efficient than relinquishing our worldviews, which is why we have slavery, holocausts, lynchings, and witch trials in our short human history. Why can be an evolutionary question. Second, ask yourself or selves, what can I or we learn from this? I love the pop star Rihanna, not just because she smokes blunts and ball gowns, but because one of her earliest tattoos says, Never a failure, always a lesson. If the only thing I can learn from a situation is that some humans do bad things, it's a waste of my precious time. I already know that. What I want to know is, what can this teach me and us about how to improve our humanity? What can we learn? In every situation, there are lessons that lead to transformation. Third, how can my real-time actions contribute to transforming this situation versus making it worse? This question feels particularly important in the age of social media where we can make our pain viral before we've even had a chance to feel it. Often, we are well down a path of public shaming and punishment before we have any facts about what's happening. That's true of mainstream takedowns, and it's true of interpersonal grievances. 
we air our dirt not to each other but with each other with hashtags or in specific but nameless rants to the public and to those who feed on our weakness and divisions. We make it less likely to find room for mediation and transformation. We make less of ourselves. Again, there are times when that kind of calling out is the only option, particularly in relation to those of great privilege who are not within our reach. But if you have each other's phone numbers or are within two degrees of social media connection, and particularly if you are in the small, small percentage of humans trying to change the world, you actually have access to transformative justice in real time. Get mediation support. Think of the community. Move toward justice. Real time is slower than social media time where everything feels urgent. Real time often includes periods of silence, reflection, growth, space, self-forgiveness, processing with loved ones, rest, and responsibility. Real-time transformation requires stating your needs and setting functional boundaries. Transformative justice requires us, at minimum, to ask ourselves questions like these before we jump, teeth bared for the jugular. I think this is some of the hardest work. It's not about pack hunting an external enemy. It's about deep shifts in our own ways of being. But if we want to create a world in which conflict and trauma aren't the center of our collective existence, we have to practice something new, ask different questions and access again our curiosity about each other as a species. And so much more. I want us to do better. I want us to feel like we are responsible for each other's transformation, not the transformation from vibrant, flawed humans to bits of ash, but rather the transformation from broken people and communities to whole ones. I believe transformative justice could yield deeper trust, resilience, and interdependence. All these mass and intimate punishments keep us small and fragile. And right now, our movements and the people within them need to be massive and complex and strong. I want to hear what y'all think and what you're practicing in the spirit of transformative justice towards wholeness and evolution loves. This has been Emergent Strategy. Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, written by Adrienne Marie Brown. Resilience, Part 2.